Well, thanks, everybody. Um, I think we're ready to get started. I see you all chose this room, which makes a lot of sense because there's nothing going on in the other room. As far as we know. Forced you to be here, but I hope you will enjoy it. This session is a panel discussion about virtual presence management. And we will take um, the next roughly 30 minutes, half an hour, maybe 35 minutes, depending how it goes, to get the expert view of the nice gentleman I have up here on stage, which I will introduce shortly. Um, after that, we will have a couple of minutes for Q&A. So if you have questions, you know, pin them down and um, ask us. We will hand you the microphone after the session. Regarding the questions, you know, please ask questions. Don't state your point of view. <laughs> um, we know you're all experts on the topic that we're talking about, but uh, we're sitting here and you're sitting it's there. there. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. Um, keep it short so we can um, handle a lot of questions, hopefully. And we'll be at the event afterwards with alcohol. Exactly. You can talk to us, share your views with us. We're really happy to discuss this, but uh, not during the Q&A, please. All right, let's get started. Um, virtual presence management I introduced or reintroduced this morning in the keynote. And you might have seen the, f um, the flyer outside. Uh, it's a new term for us. It defines how we think about content management. Uh, from the perspective of the customer, where we think you want to open up your business, your enterprise, your data, your processes to these virtual channels, to the web, to mobile, uh, you, you know, bring uh, additional um, transactional activities to your customers. And I will start uh, introducing Tim Walters here before I ask him the first question. Make this uh, really exciting here. So Tim Walters, um, you might know him, he's the guy over there. Uh, he used to work for Forestry, he has his own consultancy now, it's called Digital, Clar uh, Digital Clarity Group, Digital Clarity Group, it's difficult for me, DGC. DGC. It's a fantastic group of people that we happened to work with a couple of months ago in a really cool webinar that's still available online, and I'm glad that Tim joined them after the webinar, so maybe we convinced him that these are cool <laughs> guys. Um, <laughs> Um, he's, you know, a senior analyst. He's worked for Forrester before, and he has worked um, for lots of other um, companies before that. He really knows the business inside out, and he's uh, giving us the analyst's view tonight. So, um, Tim, just to start out um, with a little bit of a warm-up for VPM, uh, how do you see the um, organization's website differs today from uh, how it looked like 10 years, 15 years ago? Okay, uh, so thanks, Boris. Um, I think even how it should look today rather than the way it does look today is, is a better question. Obviously, it looks a lot different than it did 10 or 15 years ago, uh, and that's really good, um, but too many websites today look a lot like they did four or five years ago, and that's, that's not adequate. So let me um, talk two, two points here, and don't let me take too much time. Um, he's got the microphone to hit me with. Um, first of all, I'm a show of hands. Raise your hand if you were alive in 2007. If you didn't raise your hand, you might be right, because if you think about beginning of 2007, five years ago, just five years ago, there was no iPhone. Of course, there was no iPad. There were no apps. I mean, apps in the modern sense of the word. Uh, there were, you know, you couldn't check in. There was no Foursquare. There was no... Um, uh, Facebook, well, Facebook was three months old as a public site. You had never heard of it before. Uh, Apple was um, on the verge of bankruptcy, so on and so forth. Uh, and look at how much it's changed in five years, right? 50 billion apps downloaded uh, as of November of last year on the uh, iPad, uh, I mean, on the o iOS alone. And my point is simply that uh, one, if you, oh, the other thing that there wasn't at the time was uh, Angry Birds. So <laughs> um, people play Angry Birds uh, for 4,000 hours a week around the world, uh, 4,000 years a week around the world. So if you think you weren't alive at the time, maybe you weren't. Um, but one, you know, it's not just things change, because things always change. But I think that something has fundamentally changed, if not a revolution, then a real important and significant evolutionary leap uh, in those in those five years, and this points directly to the need for virtual presence management and substantially radically different notions of what it means to be online and across other channels. And so, the second thing I want to do is point to a quote by Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian sociologist in the 50s, who was the first theorist of media, and he had this notion that when a new media appears, like television, 
Um, it begins by imitating the old medium. You may have heard this before, right? So that early television shows were basically radio programs with a camera, right? And it takes a while for the new medium to figure out what it really is and to express its true nature. But in fact, he didn't quite say that. And I finally found the quote that, he's, that, that people are referring to. And in a television interview in 1960, and I want to read this because I think it's really important. When any new form of media comes into the foreground, we naturally look at it through the old stereotypes. And then he says, we're, we're trying to fit the old things into the new form instead of asking, what is the new form going to do to all of the assumptions we had before? And of course, you need to ask the same questions about, um, about the internet. And the important thing here is that it's not a question of waiting around for the new media to express its new medium, to express its true nature. Rather, the new medium has its own forces and dynamics, and it will affect changes whether you are ready for them or not. The failing lies with us. We can't adapt to the new medium right, quickly enough. We still think of it in the old formats. And so if we think about the Internet or the web, but let's say the Internet, Initially, we thought of it as basically a brochure. That's what it was. It was an electronic brochure. Then it was a catalog, right? You could look through it to find product information. Then it was actually a kind of a store, and you could order stuff, right? Then people thought that video was going to be the future of the web, and so forth. And then, obviously, social has a gigantic impact. I think that with mobility, and this would take a much longer argument, with mobility, we've probably reached the beginning of the expression of the true form of the internet as a medium. And okay. that will bring unbelievably significant changes in the way that you, that you do your work. Uh, for example, trying to provide not just cross-channel experiences that are consistent from one channel to another, but I haven't found a good term for this, but de-channeled experiences from the point of view of the consumer it's not, I want to have the same experience on the web channel that I have when I do the call center, that I have when I go to the ticket counter. I want to not have to think about the channel at all. Yeah, exactly. They must be yeah. absolutely transparent, and that's that de-channeled requirement in, in the mobile era. All right, Tim, I think I have to stop you here, otherwise we're going to still sit here tomorrow. I think that's fine. <laughs> Let me introduce the second panelist before the 30 minutes are over. Um, that's going to be Adrian over here, Adrian Blom. Um, he is now working for NBC, and he has, um, for the purpose of this discussion tonight, the customer-centric view on um, what is happening in the world. Before, he was analyst and consultant uh, at the um, Real Story Group, um, formerly called CMS Watch. You might have heard of them, and he's an avid blogger, so he's you know he's known around the web. So I'm really proud to have him up here today, and I will just. Um, you know, direct the question to you about virtual presence management and the change of the web. Um, how do you think, from a customer's perspective, that you need to deal with these new realities? You know, is this something that NBC is looking into, that your customers are looking into, or um, something that's being ignored? Um, well, I would love to completely disagree with Tim, <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't. I agree with <laughs> what he said. And um, I think what we're seeing as a media company is exactly what he is describing. And it's exactly the kind of thing that everybody in media is sort of afraid of because uh, when we look at our business today, what we have are linear television channels. Mm -hmm. People sit down, they turn on the television, and they start watching whatever we have as programming. And as we are switching to virtual presence, to us that means you no longer have these linear television channels. You have people going to the website and checking out all of the different videos, and then they might start playing one, watching it, and they start playing these on mobile devices. And this is completely changing the way they watch our shows as well. So we are sort of in the midst of this transition from the regular satellite TV to online TV, and of course we started out, and you can see this in our iPad app, where you have the channels. So you have NBC1, you have NBC2, and the programs are organized within these channels. Um, but as we go along, we're starting, of course, to find out that people actually want to share clips on Facebook. Hmm. And they want to see small parts of this, or they want to show their friends small parts of this. And this is going to completely turn around the way our business works as well. 
Um, so we have uh, not only a technical challenge because, um, and of course the uh, the IT guys that are working on broadcast never agree with me, but I always <laughs> tell them what we're doing is much more difficult. Um, because what they're doing is just streaming the same stream mm -hmm. to, to the channel. Whereas we have to figure out not only how to build the infrastructure to allow all this asynchronous uh, uh, watching, but also we have to figure out what people want to do with this video. And we have to be the first at this because otherwise uh, we're not going to be around as a broadcaster in 20 years time. So uh, it would be nice to also know what lies ahead, but at the same time what makes it interesting is that nobody really knows. So we have to keep moving with it as fast as we can. So we hear here agility is, is clearly um, important for the organization and it seems that the users are actually driving what you have to do. Volker, um, what's your last name? I forgot about it. Grünow. <laughs> Grünow. Uh, he's... Um, Very easy. Yeah, exactly. Volker Grünow. Um, he's managing the user groups for JBoy, and you might have heard of um, him and, uh, and the user groups. If not, I encourage you to look it up. It's really a great experience joining them. And he's responsible for the DACH uh, region, so it's Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. And he's getting people together like you and discussing. And tonight he has the point of the users of you and their, you know, their issues that they have with content management. And um, my question to you right now is, you know, how do you perceive from the perspective of the users these changes? Are they aware that something is happening? How do, how do they deal with this? Or are they still kind of you know, stuck on the desktop doing the, the old broadcast messaging? <laughs> Well, I think to answer that is um, that you need to know that um, in former times, I think enterprise drove uh, the development um, in IT. So um, a PC was made for enterprises, not for private uh, use. Um, now I think uh, consumer market is driving the business um, because um, many of you might have uh, their private uh, mobile devices uh, uh, here or also in the office. Um, and I think it's really tough for enterprises uh, to understand, or maybe not to understand, but then finally to implement uh, these new solutions. Um, so mobile is a hot topic for several years now. Um, at every conference in the last uh, three, four years, I think mobile was a hot topic, mobile enterprise. That means also internet is available um, on any device. Uh, but at the end, uh, there are just a few companies um, where I have seen um, a real enterprise, a good enterprise application um, on a mobile phone working. In the consumer market, it's different. Um, you can book your hotel on uh, booking.com, TripAdvisor. Uh, you get uh, reviews, and that leads me to a second point. Um, maybe for enterprises, um, the website... Um, will be not that important in the future as it is now. Or maybe important is the wrong word, but um, it will be more um, a business card maybe in the future. Because um, I know that's a, a tough thesis, <laughs> but um, I have been on vacation last week. I've been in Italy and Croatia. And what I did is um, I looked up for a hotel. I found, found a, a great deal uh, for a five-star hotel in Italy last minute. But I didn't find it on Google by looking uh, for hotel websites. I found it on booking.com. So I think enterprises in the future um, need to have a solution where they um, publish their also unstructured data as structured as possible. Um, maybe on their website, maybe on different um, uh, devices, uh, on, on different feeds, so that other platforms can read the content um, and can make a great mashup. Um, and you can, I think in future, if you use your mobile phone, you will use much more apps on your mobile phone and uh, read the content there and uh, don't go to a uh, video, uh, you go to a video platform to watch a video, but you don't go maybe to uh, a newspaper website just to read their content. That's my impression for the future. So, thanks, Volker, uh, for this. So clearly you have mobile use cases here. Um, we've had uh, different opinions or, or viewpoints so far. 
And I would like to talk a little bit more about mobile. Um, you, Tim, mentioned that you know this is a new media, and it's uh, it's certainly affecting or changing things, and we are not we don't realize yet um, how it will affect us. Um, so. The point that's interesting for us in terms of virtual presence for an organization is obviously, you know, where does where do all these mobile workers come from? So, um, you know, why is ev why is everything mobile now? Everything's mobile because it can be. I think it's important um, to realize that it's not mobility as such that is. It's not the mobile channel that's that's so important, right? The mobile channel is obviously has made a significant impact, I mean a dramatic impact. We talked about, you know, uh, Volker used to be one of my customers when I was at Fatwire, <laughs> and, and we were talking about, you know, the impending um, uh, mobile turn s since about 2006, and it took a long, long time for it to, to happen. But I think it's very important that it's not the mobile channel is now more, more important or becoming more important than the web, so that one channel is, is rising and the other is sinking or something like that. That effect is actually taking place, but what's important is that mobility is not the mobile channel. Mobility means always available access. Always available, always on access to, to use the old-fashioned term, computer services. Right, computing services. Right, so if you look back, you know, in the mainframe era, if you wanted access to computing services, you, you, you know, submitted a request and maybe in a couple of weeks you would get them. And then in the PC era, it becomes much faster. In the, in the laptop era, you carry it around with you. And in the mobile era, it's always, in principle, always available, always on, no, la no time lag whatsoever. And that's what's important about it. It's not the mobile channel as a channel compared to this, the other channels is that mobility now initiates an era in which computing services are ubiquitous and always available. And I think to uh, uh, here's something to add. The one thing is with enterprise mobility, the problem is security still. Yeah. Uh, so that's what I hear in the, my members' uh, groups. Um, so IT departments, information managers, uh, very often just turn it off just because of security reasons. So I think that's something we have to get rid of in the future. And maybe to add an example, um, uh, Pascal talked uh, today in the morning in the keynote about brick uh, companies uh, and brick countries. And uh, I worked at a real brick and mortar company. I was with <laughs> Wiener Berger. Wiener Berger uh, is really producing bricks. Uh, it's a world market leader. Uh, for bricks, clay roof tiles, um, sort of but game. even there, where you think that's uh, construction, building materials industry, um, if you're building your house um, and you go to the construction site in the evening and you see something, you see, let's say, a wall, and you're curious uh, if the company uh, building the wall used the right bricks. Um, what do you do? You uh, open an iPhone, uh, the website of the producer. Um, you um, put in the number of the brick. Um, for example, with Wienerberger, every brick has already his own number. And then you see the real-life production data of that brick. So you know exactly at which minute, at which second, this brick has been produced in which factory. Um, and um, that shows me um, that uh, such mobility uh, issues are even uh, with uh, brick and mortar companies mm -hmm. or for them important. So. So, so Volker, this is an excellent example of you know, opening up a corporate or organization's data and processes to the wider, you know, the virtual world. That's what we call the virtual presence, basically. Uh, you get a deep insight into the production process and possibly you can even interact with them, you know, file a claim or whatever you want to do there. Um, I want to exactly. go back to, to Edgin here. So, um, you know, we've been talking about mobile. What's, what's happening at MBC in that regard? You know, what do you see with your users, customers, viewers? What do they demand? Um, well, obviously, we're completely mobile and it's incredibly cool. Um, <laughs> um, but Can you prove it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have the numbers to prove it. No, uh, the, the interesting thing I think uh, about um, mobile is that. Uh, it, I, f I think a lot of people think of this as, as, as you pointed out as well, as another channel. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we've been talking about for years, like uh, uh, 10 years ago people would say, um, the great thing about the CMS is uh, publishing to multiple channels. Right. You can create a website and also a PDF and also a CD-ROM. Right. And <laughs> I don't know what happened to CD-ROMs in the meantime, but they're not mm -hmm. as relevant <laughs> as they used to. 
And, and you can also do mobile. And actually, in the 1990s, people were saying, you can also publish to text message. Like, this is the future. It's mobile. And the reality is that um, if you think of mobile as a challenge, uh, as a channel, then the challenge is pretty much the same across mobile and social. Right. And the thing is, you have to manage letting go of control over what you're sending out in the world. The ideal of your brochure website that completely controls uh, what you're putting out right. as a company, and especially with designers that are used to paper and want to get the color just right for the website. Uh, whereas the reality now is that your content is not just being pushed out to your website, it goes on to Google, who has their own abbreviation of what you have online. Yeah. It goes out to mobile devices that have a completely different way of displaying it. It goes out to Facebook where people are sharing it. Mm -hmm. And you suddenly find yourself trying to figure out how do I make this share nicely on Facebook or on Twitter. And uh, more and more, your content is going to circle around across the web and being reused. And your booking site example is, is a great example as well, I think, because a lot of these site, sites aggregate content from the different sites and then completely reformatted it. So you're not going to be able to manage exactly what's going on with this. And of course, nobody really wants to let go of that control. Yeah. So it has to be a, a, a flexible rubber band kind of letting go of this, uh, yeah. seeing where it ends up, where it goes, um, being very uh, aware of all the different ways that this is being reused and meshed up into different things and figuring out how this matches your business. And in our case, if our video is going to be everywhere and our programs and the clips from our programs are going to be everywhere, um, what is our gain going to be from this? Are, are we going to drive traffic back to our website? Are we going to drive viewers to our channels? Or are we going to change the whole business model around and do content marketing and product placement so this travels with the content? And I think for every kind of business, and, and this includes a brick and mortar con a yeah. company like Wienerberger, you have to figure out, so our data about our bricks is fully available, and where is it going to show up? How are people going to reuse mm -hmm. this? Mm -hmm. And that's the, the, the real challenge in, in managing that presence, because it's, it's literally going to be out of your control. So uh, you just mentioned or, or stated there is a disruptive element to it. And I would like to ask this question to you know each one of you in turn. Where do you see disruption happening? Is this you know something that existing corporations can get sidetracked, um, organizations, or you know are they aware of what's happening? Can they do something about it, or can they just sit there and say, well, it's not that bad? So, <laughs> I mean, I have the obviously the example of Amazon and the bookstores, but I'm I'm, I'm interested yeah. <laughs> in you know the other examples out there, Tim. Um. So do they, are they aware of it? So uh, on the security question that, that Fulker mentioned, I was working with a very large entertainment company in Hong Kong, and their salespeople want to and need to take sales presentations, that is PowerPoints basically, uh, on their iPads into the field, right? iPads are a great device for engaging people in the field. Uh, but they think they're a security risk, so they won't allow the um, installation of, the, of iTunes onto company computers. Mm -hmm. So, so that's how they deal with the security risk. So what, what do people do? They mail the presentation to themselves at home, load it onto iTunes at their home computer, and then put it on their, uh, on their <laughs> iPad and go out and do their work. So people are uh, allowing themselves to, they, they allow themselves the illusion of having dealt with security risk by opening a larger security risk that they're not responsible for because people are doing it at home. And that's probably an, uh, a kind of uh, analogy for, I mean, uh, analogously, larger things are happening on the, on the business process level. So I think that the, the radical view is that, yes, we are on an, in an era of tremendous disruption, and the error is in thinking that let's deal with this disruption and go back to the peaceful times. Rather, this, the, the, what I really think is necessary is to embrace disruption. And understand that you know the, with the accelerator, accelerating pace of change, disruption is going to become the standard state of affairs. And so you need to do you know whatever you need to do: agile development, lean business models, right? Constant innovation, um, you know, perpetual uh, beta, right? Whatever you want to call it, you're going to have to institute those kinds of very wrenching and fundamental business 
changes within the business itself, not at the level of how are we going to deal with the internet and new kinds of channels, how are we going to deal with our internet content on the mobile devices, but rather these are very, very fundamental business process uh, uh, issues. Adrian, your view on the disruptive element of mobile and virtual presence? Um, I think it's, it's uh, very, very obvious that there is a huge amount of disruption that comes with all of this, and, and even to the point where it's almost um, uh, boring to state this, <laughs> because we all know, and everybody here knows that this is the case. Um, I think there is uh, still a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of management layers of people that do not get this at all. Um, but that's slowly changing as well. It's, that's changing slower than the actual disruption, which is going to be the main challenge for many companies. Um, if people on a fundamental level do not understand what's going on, they're not in a very good position to manage that. Mm -hmm. And if they're not listening to it and not paying attention to it, they might bring their own companies down. And of course, I'm not talking about our company because we're <laughs> doing great, but other companies, <laughs> since you're there, <laughs> would be in, in, in trouble. <laughs> and it, it's, it, it, you can really see, and the interesting thing for me is switching from, from the Netherlands to the Middle East, is that, and I tell my colleagues as much that in the Netherlands, I used to have a, a corner grocery shop, a vegetable shop, and I could order online, and the guy would come bring it to me. And this was a couple of years ago. And I was completely used to everybody and everything being online and you go to the Middle East and you still have to deal with people who say this is never going to be anything I mean why <laughs> would you do this online that that's not going to work and um, like you said you have to embrace the fact that this is now a constant change you're not even talking about a disruption or it's a new wave mm -hmm. it's, a, a, it's a, the fundamental change is from uh, slow, steady stages to stages to stages. Mm -hmm. Like you can draw, and draw a nice graph of you have this stage, this stage, this stage, but it's going to m keep moving from there. Mm -hmm. And in 10 years' time, we'll be having a completely different conversation. Right. And we'll be having that conversation with the people who kept in touch with that and kept following it and keep shaping it, not with the people who are left behind and sitting there watching linear television. <laughs> So, Volker, uh, from your perspective, yep. I mean, the users and so on, are they, you know, did they see this, are they anxious about it, they're scared, or they embrace well, I don't it? think that, that uh, the members in our network are scared as these are the e-business managers of the organizations. But uh, I think in many organizations you have these old stereotypes, and one of the stereotypes is a one-voice policy. So you had a... Uh, a uh, press uh, person in the organization and the CEO told one story and uh, this story was then published uh, through the press de department. Uh, many organizations then learned with the help of social media that this is not the case anymore um, and uh, that such a one voice policy simply doesn't exist uh, anymore. Um, even if you believe it exists, it exists, uh, it just does not exist because people will talk in Facebook or in any other social media platform about you. And I think that's a clear transition, but um, at the end, um, I think uh, we all here in the room, uh, not um, IT managers, uh, even not information managers, uh, not marketing managers, uh, our responsibility is change management. Uh, because if we want uh, that uh, our organizations uh, in the future uh, can deal with all these uh, things, then we are the people who have to go to the management, explain that to the management, and that simply means preaching a lot, because it means telling them the same story again and again and again, and also to learn um, how to talk to management, uh, to develop stories, uh, and then to uh, tell these stories inside of the organizations. I think that's the only way how we can uh, make change happen inside of the organization. So, uh, I recently read, and this is going to be the last couple of minutes here, I guess, I know it's coming towards the end of the day and you're looking forward to the party. To um, beer. <laughs> to beer. 
guess uh, you deserve it. I recently read this, uh, I think this week, last week maybe, about, um, and I'm, I'm driving a lot in, in taxis these days with all the stuff that's going on, um, about an app in Germany actually called something like My Cab or My Taxi, or so you might know it better than I do. And that's a disruptive um, app, it's a disruptive business model in, in the sense that um, traditionally as a cab driver you go to you know, your, your center and you pay in Germany at least 450 euros per month and if you're on holidays, you're on holidays, they don't care, you know you have to pay anyway so you don't even make any money um, out of this and there's this new application uh, that uh, you know, anybody can download for free and if you book a cab and the cabbie has kind of the counterpart of this application um, he can just say, oh yeah, I'm going to pick you up. Uh, he pays, I think, like something like 79 cents for it, um, and he's completely free. Like if he's only three uh, three days of a month, uh, you know, driving his cab, that's you know, that's what he can do. And this is completely disruptive. Um, that's uh, Germany, and lots of cabs obviously are leaving these centers and they're taking on this service because it's much more flexible. The centers can't do anything about it. They have yeah. two opportunities, you know, um, right now. They can either say um, we do nothing which is what the Germans do at the moment, apparently. Or they can do it the Swiss way. They forbid the cab drivers right. to use this. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, the last question, the last round here is, you know, which way will it go? You know, what, what's going to happen to those companies? What's going to happen to them? Do you want me to go first? Uh, it's going to go both ways. Um, as these things always do, there are going to be the, a lot of forces of resistance. Um, uh, both in, in this area, that is companies that are trying to preserve established business models that they either cannot possibly adapt uh, to the new um, conditions, as in the centralized taxi distribution, uh, that's just outright war, uh, or they are potentially capable of adapting to the new conditions and becoming more lean and agile and themselves self-disruptors but they don't know how to do it or they're not able to do it, right? So they, the, all they can do is resist and, and they have good economic motivations to resist. Um, but eventually, uh, <laughs> the forces of change will, will win uh, as, as they always do. Adrian? Um, I think um, one of the most interesting examples, analogous to, to, to what you were saying, is that, of course, if you're talking about um, TV and movies and music, um, you can go sort of the American way and try to sue every kid mm -hmm. that has downloaded <laughs> 12 songs. Um, but the reality, especially in the Middle East, is that there's a huge amount of piracy going on. And um, there's going to be people in countries where there is no legal system that we can attack them on copyrights or make them stop this, etc. So for us, the very real challenge is how are we going to be better at this mm -hmm. than the alternatives? So and again, it's about embracing this change and being better than the free option, being better than a torrent website or some forum that is using our clips or some uh, news site that is using our photographs from Arab idols, etc. We just have to be better than these people and be there earlier than they are. Um, and I think for many different businesses, the same is going to apply. And your cab driver's example is a great one because I don't think you're going to be able to stop this even by banning it from being used. This is not something you can, uh, where you can institutionalize all business models and protect mm -hmm. them that way. Mm -hmm. So, so but we better be ready for it. Well, honestly, I think yeah, both worlds will exist in the future, online as well as uh, offline. So there is a case uh, with uh, cupcakes in the US. These are the small, sweet cakes, I think, made 100% out of sugar. <laughs> and um, Mary, um, I don't know her, her, her last name, but Mary uh, ordered some cu uh, cupcakes for the birthday party um, of her son. And she paid then, I think, 20 bucks uh, just for delivery or something like that. So, so she thought, well, why uh, we don't make an online business out of it? So she started a uh, uh, cupcake bakery, uh, which uh, where you can just order online and deliver it, um, I think, in a few hours. And delivery costs a lot cheaper than uh, for the old-fashioned uh, cupcake bakeries. Um, and now both world, uh, worlds exist. So I think there is just uh, for both worlds enough market uh, in, in many um, businesses. So I think both taxi driver, 
types uh, will exist in the future. Uh, and even if we are here on a web conference, um, uh, we should not forget that uh, uh, the best hotel uh, I have chosen in Croatia was a hotel which has no website, <laughs> just, uh, I think, two rooms, uh, private apartments, uh, and it was the best experience. So even that world will exist in the future. Can, can I have one point of criticism on that? Because... You're saying there's going to be room for both the real and virtual worlds, and of course, I completely disagree because <laughs> if you would watch our television <laughs> channels, in Dubai. <laughs> then, then you would realize that what's on television is much better than reality, and especially if you can get it in a virtual way. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot. Uh, questions? I heard it hinted somehow with the mashups and things like that, but I didn't hear the word semantic once, so <laughs> is that, does semantic play any role in the future? <laughs> Whom do you ask of the three? Please always ask. He wants, um, to, he wants to answer. Well, um, actually, I heard it hinted by everybody. So. <laughs> well, I think um, semantic is important. There are some great projects. For example, uh, Salzburg Research uh, just works on such an... A semantic um, engine, f especially for CMS, um, where uh, I saw some uh, some uh, use cases. For example, editors uh, entering just uh, content, and by entering content, they see on the right hand side uh, then, for example, locations. If there is a city name like London, then they can directly link uh, to that. Uh, uh, city, or they see further information about people and all that stuff. Um, so I think that's the first step for semantic, also included in um, CMS. There are many other uh, ideas, I think, um, how you can use semantic, uh, especially in a web content management system. So I think semantic will, of course, play um, a role in the future. Uh, especially because I think uh, we will never get rid of all that unstructured data we have, and semantic, uh, of course, helps us a little bit to make unstructured data a little bit more uh, structured. And uh, the interesting thing, I think, about uh, the semantic web as a term as well is that I always feel slightly sad about the semantic web <laughs> because I remember in 98, 99, I was working at a university and we were working on a semantic web project and trying to model knowledge, etc. And these were very lofty goals and ideals. And in the meantime, we've had Web 2.0, which has turned into social, quote unquote, in general. And there's still the people going, yes, but the semantic web is going to be Web 3.0, <laughs> or maybe right. then it will become 4.0. And the reality of it is that it's, uh, it's very hard to do right. Um, because it takes a lot of effort. It's not just a technical challenge. You have to actually model knowledge instead of just dumping unstructured stuff. And uh, the, the moment where I thought this is actually going to go somewhere is when Google started actually implementing rich snippets and actually making it useful for you to mark up your stuff right. on, on, your, on the website and making it very tangible what the benefit of this is. And at the same time, you see that a social network like Facebook is actually forcing everybody to mark up their stuff as well. And the more sophisticated this becomes, the more we are going to be challenged with using semantic markup and making sense of this for the different reuses that we see across all of these channels. Any more questions uh, by anybody who is afraid that the virtual presence and mobile revolution will disrupt their <laughs> business or party business. You're all with the party already, all right? Well, thank you then, thanks. <laughs>